Again, welcome to Canyon Hills. I'm excited that all of you guys are here. If you're new, I see a few newer faces. If you're, if you're fairly new, we've been in this series studying the minor prophets. And I will tell you, they're called minor prophets not because they're less than the major prophets, but because they have a lot to say in less words. They're known as minor because of their brevity compared to Jeremiah or Isaiah, who have a lot of chapters. In fact, the Siphoniah, who we're study, studying today, ha only has three chapters. So how many of you guys did all of your reading this week? We were supposed to all be in it together as a church, and three chapters is not a lot uh, to read. So let me just tell you, there, there's a, just to kind of catch us up to speed, there is a map of, of old Israel up on the, on, on the screen. At this point, uh, what I'm about to read, this kingdom has been divided into two kingdoms. If you remember, we started 1 Samuel, and we discovered that the first king of Israel, it was King Saul, and then after king, him, King David, and then his son, King Solomon. They all were kings over one kingdom. They called it the king of Israel. But by this time, it had been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, which is comprised of 10 of the tribes. There's 12 tribes in Israel. 10 of the tribes were up in the north, and two of the tribes were down in the south referred to as Judah. Sephaniah is going to refer to Judah, Judah, and he's talking about the southern kingdom. At this point in our story, the northern kingdom, those ten tribes, have already been taken over by the Assyrians, and they, they no longer kind of exist. They're being, being overran by, by the Assyrians, and that's what where Sephaniah steps into the scene and does that. Now, what I want us to do this morning as we study the book of Sephaniah and, and we open up the scriptures, and I know they're going to be up on the screen, but I always like to follow along in your Bibles. And even if you still have your phones, please turn them on because we're going to be going verse by verse. I believe context is, context is important, so I'll be talking a little bit about that. But I want us to take a look at the scriptures with a very specific set of, I'm going to call them a goggles in mind. You know, oftentimes we look at Scripture and we open the Bible and, and if, depending on what we're going through, you know, we may need comfort and we look for comfort in Scriptures. Sometimes we open and we need direction and wisdom and we want to look for it with that wisdom goggles in mind. Well, today I want you to put certain goggles in mind and I want you to ask yourself a question. What implications does this have for me and for our country? Or is this an Old Testament book that doesn't matter anymore because it's so long ago that why are we even reading it, right? What implications does this have for me and for our country? Richard, is that up there? Thank you. Sephaniah's great-grandfather, King Hezekiah, he reigned for 29 years. And King Hezekiah experienced like what we would call a revival. That means where people came back to God and he, he did some wonderful spiritual reforms. And he took, because, you know, at this point in the Israelites' history, there was a lot of pagan worship. There was a lot of gods and they had erected a lot of buildings and a lot of statues and a lot of high places, as that's what they would call them. And King Hezekiah came down and he tore all of those down. In fact, as an example, he even took one of the bronze serpents that Moses used in the wilderness when he held out as a symbol of, of healing for the children of Israel. But by that time, they were so, uh, I guess, superstitious that the Israelites started to worship this bronze stick or serpent that Hezekiah had it broken into pieces so that they wouldn't worship that instead of worshiping their God. But after Hezekiah's death, things declined so rapidly that his son, a guy by the name of King Manasseh, he was on the throne for 55 years, and he brought Judah down quickly. Although for us, 55 years may be long because of our, our lifetime here on earth, but in the, in, the, in the context of the world history, 55 years is not long at all. But he brought Judah down so quickly in fact, he built up all of these high places and fortified them. He strengthened them. And then his son, Manasseh, had a son by the name of Amon. He followed. He had a brief two-year reign. And the Bible always tells us when you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, which we're going to study, by the way, as we move forward from here, I believe that God is asking us to go into that after this. It'll either say by a king, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, or he did good in the sight of the Lord. And this king, Amen, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Josiah comes in after him. And Josiah, it, they, some people say, some scholars believe that there was some a revival again under King Josiah. Remember, this is already like almost 100 years, and all of a sudden there's a king that wants to do better for them. Now, the purpose of a revival, the, the purpose of a spiritual revival or renewal is to always, it always 
makes God more famous. It is that people would focus on God's power, that people would focus on his name, and not the name or the power of the person or people bringing about that revival. So it's not about Zephaniah, it's not about King Josiah, but it's always pointing back to God. But did you know that every revival is followed by an attack? And that is exactly what happens in the book of Zephaniah. Which reminds me of this story that is attributed to this, this guy by the name of Sheikh Rashid. Now, I say attributed because there's a lot of, we don't know exactly who it came from, but the point is the same. And he was the founder of Dubai, and he was asked about the future of his country. And this is what he replied. He said, my grandfather rode a camel. My father rode a camel. I ride a Mercedes. My son rides a Land Rover. And my grandson is going to ride a Land Rover. But my great-grandson is going to ride a camel again. Why is that, they asked. And he replied, hard times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men, and weak men create difficult times. And when you add that to the historical context of all of these great empires that we're talking about back in the, in the Old Testament, like the Persians and the Trojans and all these that we read about, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and even the Romans, did you know that they all rose to power and collapsed within 240 years? And although all of them were, well, most of them were conquered by external enemies, they all first collapsed within. Now, this story is about financial success, right? This, this example with Sheikh Rashid that I told you about. Uh, for me, I mean, uh, my mom grew up poor. I grew up regular poor. My kids are doing okay, I think, and I believe their kids are going to do okay. But if they don't work hard, chances are their next generation won't do as well. I think the same thing can be true for our faith. I can speak for personal experience. My mom was very intentional, went out of her way, of her way so that I could have a relationship with Christ. And I believe that I have worked hard to do the same for my kids. And I hope that my kids do the same for their kids. And I'm going to pray that the next generation of them continue to do that as well. But if we ease off, if we let off, if we take our relationship for God, with God for granted, and we don't teach our kids and our next generations the values found in God's word, then maybe we will ride camels. I don't know. It's an interesting thing to ponder. So, Siphoniah had his ministry through King Josiah. And all of the names that I just talked to you about are basically mentioned in the first verse. But remember, we're going to look at this with certain goggles. What implications does it have for me and for our country? Siphoniah 1 1, the word of the Lord that came to Siphoniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, who I talked to you about, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah talking to the southern kingdom. Now, again, some of the reforms that were wrought about under King Josiah, also they, they were really a bright spot and really a dark background. But we're going to find out and we read that they weren't really lasting changes. And sometimes we may experience some spiritual things that happen in our lives, but sometimes if we're not careful, it'll only mask what's really inside. It's almost like an outward appearance instead of having this deep transformation that happens in our heart. And that's really what Sephaniah is getting to in this moment. It, it was during Sephaniah's ministry, along with his contemporary, this other prophet by the name of Jeremiah, that brought the nation back on track, but it didn't last very long. Now, we're used to that by now as we study the minor prophets, right? We're used to the fact that so many other prophets had near and far fulfillment or predictions or prophecy that would say something's going to happen to you soon for the nation, and then they would talk about the day of the Lord, which is, uh, and, you know, end of times type of stuff. And then this is what he says. Sephaniah starts predicting, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all of mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And right off the bat, he's talking about near and far things that are going to happen, except the far off is going to be this worldwide, very serious thing that happens. And that's really the theme of this book. 
the day of the Lord. Zephaniah mentions the day of the Lord more than any other minor prophet besides Joel. And what he's doing is that he's going to use the invasion of the Babylonians. Remember last week we talked about how the Assyrians took over the north and the Babylonians is eventually are going to take over and then come down south to Judah. And he's going to use that as a template or a model for the day of the Lord, which is an event that is going to happen in the future. And this is going to go over all of the earth. And this is what Zephaniah says. I will stretch, stretch out my hand against Judah and then against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of, here's, here's the, the, the part that I, I'm focusing on, the remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priest. Now, quickly, the Canaanite god of Baal and his female counterpart, Asherah, were always, if we read the, the Old Testament, were always stumbling blocks. They were always a temptation for the people of Judah and the people of Israel. There was this long-standing relationship of them building these high places for, for Baal worship. And again, King Hezekiah, remember, broke them down. His son Manasseh builds them up. And now Josiah is trying to break them down again. And, and God now promises that he's going to do this very thorough cleansing of the land where all of these false gods, these idolatrous priests, and their practices are going to be banished once and for all. Now, when you read this in the context of, remember those goggles, of you and, and me and our country, we, we have to kind of ask ourselves a question at this point early in this book, is if we're looking at all these generations and we see what they're doing and the implications that it has and the decisions that they're making, we need to ask ourselves, are we going to be, you and I, because it has very real implications for you and I, are we going to be part of the tearing down idols generation? Or are we going to be part of the building up idols generation? There's a third option. We could just be complicit and not do anything. Hezekiah tears them down. Manasseh builds them up. Josiah tears them down. But here's the point. God ultimately is telling Sephaniah, you guys can choose, but if you say no, I'm going to take care of it for you. So what implication does it have for me personally that if I decide to continue to worship things above God, I can do that, but eventually God's going to take care of that as well. Now, the implications that it may have for our country, you know, I, I keep talking to a lot of people and we have some deep conversations about it, and I will tell you that, that I will not get political from the pulpit, but I am an immigrant and I appreciate this country so much. There's so many beautiful things about it that I want to protect that as well. And one of the things that I really like about this country and that I admire is that it is a country of the people by the people. And, and as such, our country should reflect the views of, his, of its people. And if enough of us, if enough Christians decide to be part of the tearing down of idols generation, then our country will reflect that. And that's about as political as I'm going to get from the pulpit. Those who bow down on the roofs to worship, verse 5, to worship the starry hosts, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and also who also swear by Moloch. He keeps mentioning all of these idols that they had. And what they're doing here is that they had, again, this temple, and they had this bright, gleaming structure in the center of Jerusalem, and they would swear one day by the name of Yahweh. Yahweh is the Old Testament name for God, and they would swear by the name of Yahweh. And then, at the same time, they had all these other altars, and they would start, like, taking practices from everything that they liked, and in essence, they would make up their own religion. I remember going through the cafeteria, you know, it's like having this cafeteria approach through our faith where we just kind of take the parts that we like, and I don't like that, that, that one, so I'm just going to take it from here. And at the end of the day, we have this mix of religion that's, is it really called Christianity at that point? It's like me preaching to you right now and preaching Jesus and going tomorrow and, and, and consulting a psychic to tell me what to tell you next Monday. It just doesn't make sense. And that's what these people, the Israelites, were doing at the time. Zephaniah 1.6 said, Those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire in of him. And what Zephaniah is now referring to, along with the other scriptures, is that they, they had this belief system that the, the, the stars governed the future of mankind. 
So they erected altars all around. And, and when God talks about the God of Molech, Molech was the God of the Ammonites. The Ammonites li lived east of Judah. And, and if you read the history of doing worship and, and sacrifices to Molech, it was really depraved. They would sacrifice babies in such a way that it was just unfathomable. In fact, I don't even want to write about it or, or talk to you about it. But if you studied, it was really depraved in such a way that even God came in Leviticus and said, hey, you cannot sacrifice babies. That's just, I'm just, God is like, you can't do that. And now they've come so long and they're still doing that to sacrifice. But this time it was just to sacrifice to this guy named Molech. And it was, again, those altars that, that Josiah was starting to bro break down. But now Hezephaniah has is, is, is had enough of them, and God has had enough. And he's saying, by the way, I'm done. God is saying, I am done. Again, which tells me the same implications for me. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about implications. Carlos, if you do not decide to be part of tearing down idols, because we all have them, I have them, then God's going to take care of it. There's an overarching truth to all of these prophets all of these minor prophets, and that they, every single one of them denounced idolatrous worship and practices. You see, God created us to worship him. By nature, we are created to worship God. But one of the things that God also did is that he gave us liberty and freedom to choose him, or else he would just have a bunch of robots praising God. He wanted you to choose to praise God and to worship God. And when we don't do that, our inclination is to worship that if we don't worship God, we end up worshiping something else to just fill that void that we feel inside and that need to worship. And that void and those things that we fill it with are idolatrous practices. And there's a list of things that we do, but for us, they fall into three categories. Sex, money, and power. Everything that we worship has to do with those three things. Even drugs and all, whatever it is, they all fall under that. And now I will tell you, I mean, things haven't really changed. I mean, today people still read their horoscopes and, and do their, you know, look at zodiacs to tell their future. Sometimes it's fun. In fact, did you know that there's three times as many psychics and astrologers as there are pastors and priests and clergymen? In other words, people haven't really changed over these thousands of years. So Zephaniah says in verse 7, Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and he has consecrated those he has invited. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, he says, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign clothes. It's interesting because God calls it a sacrifice, like if he's about to sacrifice something, but that's not really what he means. Zephaniah says that God is going to have an event, and there's going to be a sacrifice, and the people's sacrifice are the Israelites. And he has a special guest invited, the Babylonians, to come and feast on the sacrifice is really what he's talking about here. An interesting note, he says, all those clad in foreign clothes... Because it would seem that the people in Judah were so influenced by the pagan worship around them that not only were they starting to follow their practices, they thought it was cool to dress like them without giving it any thought. Sephaniah says, On that day I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. All those who avoid stepping on... It's amazing how much prophets knew the word of God and knew what happened in the past. And I'm glad this came up because we studied this in 1 Samuel, if you remember. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And the Philistines took to capture the Ark and, and they went to kind of store it in another temple by another god, their god, Dagon. And they go and they put it in Dagon's temple and the next day they wake up and Dagon, the statue that they worship, was face down against the Ark of the Covenant. So obviously they didn't like that. So they picked Dagon's statue back up and they put it on its pedestal. The next day they return and this time Dagon is broken. His head is broken on the threshold floor and his hands are broken off and also laying on the threshold floor. And because of that, the Philistines were superstitious so they would never step on the threshold floor and they would leap over that temple. Well, which is fine if for the Philistines, they don't follow God. But the Israelites started to do that. 
They thought it was the, the right thing to do because they heard about that and they saw it, so they wouldn't step on the threshold floor. And they started the same superstitious practice, which is why Sephaniah is mentioning that on day he's going to punish all those who don't have a true understanding and belief of God's word because they do things like superstitious stuff, like stepping over the threshold floor. And because of that, none of their priests would dare step on that. Sephaniah 1.10 says, On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you who live in the market district. All your merchants will be wiped out. All who trade with silver will be destroyed. The fish gate, it's an actual gate. It was on the north side of Jerusalem, and today it's called the Damascus Gate. It was facing the north, and it was called the fish gate basically because the fish came in from, from the ports through that gate. And in the quarter, the second quarter was beyond inside the city. Now, coincidentally, just so you guys know, as we study this, the fish gate, the northern gate, is where they called them to wail and moan, remember? That is the very gate that King Nebuchadnezzar from the Babylonian armies first penetrated the city when it fell in 586. That's why he says the fish gate. At that time, verse 12, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, neither good or bad. What a thing to say. They're basically saying what a deist would say. You know, there is a God, and if there is a God, he's not a personal God. He's neither going to do good nor bad. So they're really denying the providential authority of God while still practicing whatever they wanted to practice, idolatrous ways, in this case, evil. And he refers to those who are settled in complacency as wine left on its dregs. And for those of you that drink wine... You know what a wine drag looks like. It is a thickened crust that develops in the wine that is fermenting over a period of time if left undisturbed. Sometimes it's actually a really good bottle of wine because you're leaving it there. It starts developing these dregs, but eventually it settles to the bottom. And God is saying, listen, you guys are getting a little crusty, a little hardened, a little complacent, a little complicit that you're just settling settling to the bottom, thinking that, you know, we serve a good God. He won't do anything good or won't do anything bad. He's just like, he won't do anything. They were utterly complacent. And Sephaniah starts to provide this from here on out into chapter 2 and, verse, and chapter 3. Sephaniah starts to provide this very vivid imagery of the coming judgment. And those of you that read it understand that it is, he describes it as, as utterly desolate, dark and gloomy clouds and darkness. And he, he starts to describe the day of the Lord, which speaks of end times as well. As a period of time when we get there, it's going to affect all of the earth. And then... Sephaniah spends a lot of time describing the coming judgment. He, he goes from the day of the Lord into what's going to happen to Judah and its people. And then he goes into the nations and what's going to happen to the nation, those enemies. What's interesting is that God has always used Israel's enemies for his purposes before destroying them, which is interesting. But because of Judah's unrepentance and their decisions to continue in their idolatrous ways... You know, they, they could have turned from their ways. We've seen that. We saw, we saw that in the book of Jonah when, when, when Micah preached or when Jonah didn't want to preach to the Ninevites. He goes to the Nineveh and they repented with sackcloth and, and weeping and they, they were able to repent and God spared them of that destruction. So, so we can change God's mind, if you will, if we repent. Verse 13 says, He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and dry as a desert. And we already talked about that. That already happened. It was a prophecy that came through in 612 B.C. And then this is kind of what, I, what really caught my attention personally. This is the city of revelry, speaking of Nineveh. Okay? They lived in safety. She said to herself, I am the one, and there is no one besides me. What a ruin she has become. In other words, he's talking about the people of Nineveh and that whole nation, and they become so confident in themselves and their nature that it started to create this arrogance, this pride, thinking that nothing could ever hurt them. 
They felt like they were the greatest country in the world, but pride had set in. They felt invincible both as individuals and as a nation. Sounds a little familiar as from what I'm reading. You know, I'm going to call the worship team up as I close this morning. But here's what I believe and I pray that God, that Zephaniah is telling us today and what God wants us to hear. It comes from chapter 2, verse 1. He says, gather together. Gather yourselves together, you shameful nation. You know, there's something about gathering together like we are doing now. It gets God's attention. When we worship God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our souls in this morning, we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into our lives in such a way that he wants to commune with us and speak to us, and he hears us as we do that. Verse 3 says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands, you seek righteousness. You seek humility. Everybody else out there can do whatever they want. They can practice whatever they want. But you, you seek righteousness and seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. You know, as I contemplate the implications for me and our country, my, I'm going to call it my country, you know, I believe that God is already, even before he walked into this room, is already speaking to you on what he would have you do. And that you would contemplate the implications just for you first. I'm not even going to say, just forget the country for a second, just you. Because if I'm honest this morning, I can tell you there's some things sometimes that I struggle with putting above God, even as a pastor. And this morning I repent from that and I tell you as your pastor, man, I, I wish I could get on my knees and just do it right now. But God is calling us as the church not only to dig deep into scripture, what he's bringing us through this process and he's already asked us to forgive first. For, you forgive yourself and then you start to forgive others, people you haven't forgiven for years, that he's calling you now to repent. From what? He's already telling you right now. I know that in my heart that he's telling you exactly what he's asking you to repent from. To turn from your idolatrous ways. To seek in humility your God. To seek his righteousness first before he adds all these other things. You know, I'll remind you that as a church, we're going through this for a very specific reason. We believe God is speaking to us especially through this minor prophet. And I feel it in my heart that he just wants us to be able to withstand the attacks of culture and the attacks of the enemy because we know something different than everybody else does. That no matter what gets thrown our way this coming year, we can all agree that it's at least going to be interesting. So you are going to be a different people because you understand about repentance and forgiveness and his scripture. So I would ask him this morning that you would close your eyes and bow your heads with me and that you would have an encounter and that you would respond to your God and seek what he would have you do. Father, I come before you in this moment. Lord, and we're all contemplating the things that we have put above you. Lord, maybe we don't call it idolatrous waste, Lord, but we just learned today that we're like wine dregs settling to the bottom. Father, we don't want to do that anymore. Father, I don't want to do that. Even if it's white lies all the way up, Father, we just want to surrender to you like we sang about earlier, that you would come before us, Lord, that you would transform us by the renewing of our mind, Father, that we would be able to withstand the attacks of the enemy, not only for ourselves, but for our children, our families, this church, and our nation. Father, this has implications. So let's do the work, Lord, that only you can do. We're putting it and we're surrendering at your feet, Father. Lord, and I pray that as Sephaniah just said these words, Father, that they would fall on us, that we would believe them, Father, when he said in chapter 3, verse 12, that he will leave with us the meek and the humble, the remnant of Israel, those who will trust in the name of the Lord, they will do no wrong and they will tell no lies and they will not have a deceitful tongue and they will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid, Father. That is our prayer this morning, that we can say that through the words of Zephaniah, 
We pray these things, Father, and as we do that, you tell us to just shout out loud in Israel and to rejoice with all of our hearts and to sing to our God and to take great delight in you because what you're about to do, in his love, we will not be rebuked. And Lord, we will rejoice in our singing. In Jesus' name I pray.